In the winter of 1910, the isolated Ile de la Madeleine's undersea telegraph line, their only contact with the rest of Canada, was severed in a storm. The people living on those islands, who were called Madeleineau, were completely isolated and seemingly forgotten, running low on food and medical supplies in the cold winter weather, with no link to the mainland of Canada. In a desperate effort to let the government know about their plight, they took a large, empty wooden barrel that once held molasses, which in French is called a penchant. One cold February evening as the sun was setting, the people of the islands gathered by the cold and icy sea and watched their penchant float away, carrying with it not only letters containing pleas for help, but also carrying their hopes and dreams to be reconnected with the mainland of Canada. You're listening to Backyard History, The hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes. With your host and author, Andrew McLean. If you drew a straight line on a map between Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and another one from Cape Breton to the furthest west part of Labrador... The X where those two lines cross, way within the middle of the St. Lawrence, you would find the Ile de la Madeleine. These islands themselves are an isolated, fog-shrouded, and windswept archipelago consisting of seven inhabited islands, most of which are connected to one another by these long sand dunes. Today they're a popular tourist destination, boasting white sandy beaches that would rival PEIs, towering cliffs that would rival Fundy's, a lobster fishing industry to rival Nova Scotia's, and puffins, seals, and whales that would make even Newfoundland jealous. But despite being geographically right smack in the middle of Atlantic Canada, politically speaking, the islands are actually a part of Quebec. Technically, they're called, in English, the Magdalene Islands, but growing up in bilingual New Brunswick, I really only ever heard them called by their French name, which is Les Îles de la Madeleine. Honestly, it just kind of sounds weird to me to call them by their English name. I don't, I don't quite understand where that G sound came from in Magdalene. So I'm going to just stick with the French name that I'm more familiar with, Ile de la Madeleine, for this episode. Back before Europeans ever arrived, Mi'kmaq called these islands Minquit, which means battered by the waves. Much like how English and French language has changed over the past five centuries, the Mi'kmaq language, called Mi'kmaq Islamic, also shifted considerably, and today they call the islands Minagosinog. Mi'kmaq didn't live there year-round, but only in the summers, and they take these massive 20-foot-long canoes made out of birch bark and make the treacherous trip to the islands from Cape Breton, which is 96 kilometers away. They bring their whole families and all their possessions on these great canoes, which really highlights their remarkable navigation skills and All the knowledge about the tides, the currents, the winds, the stars, the weather patterns, and coastal approaches that would have been required to make such a treacherous journey. Last summer, I went camping on the islands with my girlfriend, Monica. We took a massive, brand new, modern ferry built in Europe. So recently, they actually hadn't gotten around to changing the power outlets from European to North American yet, but it still took us five hours to get there. We actually ended up getting stuck on the Ile de la Madeleine because a massive windstorm swept in and battered the islands, which led to my ferry home being cancelled. Also, a piece of advice learned the hard way on that trip, don't pitch your tent on the edge of a cliff if a windstorm's coming. We had to drag the tent to the middle of the woods late at night. Not recommended. But needless to say, I'm really in awe of the Mi'kmaq making these overnight trips and their fleets of open canoes on that voyage centuries earlier. But by 1910, when the penchant story is taking place, the population of these islands were booming. They exploded to some 6,000 people, which is all the more remarkable because humans had really only begun to settle on these islands about one century earlier. The reason for the big population boom was simple. Lobster. This was a strange time for lobster. As you might remember from the episode called A Brief History of the Lobster, this was exactly when Maritimers wouldn't eat lobster themselves unless they were super poor, 
but wealthy Americans had recently decided that lobster was a high-end luxury meal to be served in the fun restaurants of New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, meaning that Maritimers could suddenly make a lot of money off of selling them. So just imagine being a little kid on PEI at the turn of the century and being told you have to pack up and leave your home and your friends forever because your dad's moving you and your family to some faraway islands to catch some food that you would never ever even eat in your life. And that was the reality for hundreds of families in the earliest days of the 20th century. The people living on the Ile de la Madeleine were from a remarkably diverse background, including Acadians, French from France, Scots, Irish, Americans, Canadians, and lots of Maritimers from PEI, Cape Breton, and the North Shore. And an astonishing number of people who actually didn't even want to be there, but whose ships had crashed in the dangerous waters around the islands, and they just washed up on the Ile de la Madeleine and stayed there. One of those people who stayed there was Auguste Libourdet, who was the master of a ship called the Wasp, which was wrecked off of the islands in 1871. He was the sole survivor of the shipwreck, and he needed both of his legs amputated. He got a job in the islands as the operator of the island's one and only telegraph line that connected the Ile de la Madeleine with Cape Breton, and from there to the rest of the world. Built in 1882, the telegraph was a steel line under the sea, which, to put it in modern terms, basically allowed what we would call texting. Now the Madeleine O were able to keep up to date with the news from all over the world. They sent messages to friends and families on the mainland, merchants could in close contact with suppliers, products and services were able to be ordered, food, medicine, clothing, construction material, furniture, manufactured goods, supplies for work and fishing, everything you needed would just, you'd just send an order over the telegraph line to the mainland and the message would arrive at its destination in an instant. All that ended on January 2nd, 1910, when a severe winter storm severed the telegraph cable and isolated the Ile de la Madeleine. The Madeleine O waited for a sign from Canada's government that their only connection with the mainland was going to be restored. They waited for any sign that the rest of the country had noticed they were missing. And they waited. They waited for days, they waited for weeks. And as January turned into February, they came to the sickening realization that nobody had noticed that nothing had been heard from any of the 6,000 people living on the Ile de la Madeleine. It was so bitterly frustrating for the Madeleineau because they had long felt ignored and forgotten by Canadian government officials in faraway Ottawa. However, they felt like an extra slap in the face this time because their locally freshly elected ambitious new member of parliament was a Rudolf Lemieux, who was Canada's postmaster general. This meant that the top person in all of Canada whose job it was to maintain communications with the islands was also the island's own local representative. So it was literally Rudolf Lemieux's job, twice over, to notice that the communications with the Ile de la Madeleine had been cut but he hadn't noticed. It's been over a month. As January ended with no sign of contact with the outside world, the Madeleine had a meeting to decide what to do. This multi-linguistic, multinational population of the Seven Islands assembled at a boisterous meeting to figure out how to get the government's attention. So, you've probably heard of messages in bottles? Well, they decided to send a message in a molasses barrel to the mainland or to be more specific, a message in a penchant. A penchant was a wooden barrel, the kind that molasses, that classic staple of Maritime's food, was transported in. It wasn't a small barrel either. I found a replica of it in a museum when I was stuck on the islands in that windstorm myself and it came up to the middle of my chest. You can see a photo of me with that thing and a bunch of other photos for the story at backyardhistory.ca. But the thing with this penchant that was going to the mainland, though, was that this wasn't going to be an ordinary penchant, this was going to be a super deluxe penchant. After all, it had to make it all the way to Cape Breton, which is 96 kilometers away. This penchant was going to have a sail, and, as Charles Boudreaux later remembered in a 1964 interview, The sail was made of sheet iron made by R.J. Leslie Company, which still makes pipes here today. It was a square sail based on the kinds we saw on the big three-masted ships. However, 
attaching the sail to a mast, which would then attach to the penchant, without breaking it or letting water in was going to be difficult. The sail finished, it took a mast to support it, but it was impossible to attach a wooden mast because the water could have entered the nail hole. We therefore needed an iron mast made into the shape of a square, which our blacksmith William Reed provided, while also making the mast. According to Charles Boudreaux though, the most difficult part out of all of this was building it a rudder. It was impossible to attach a rudder made of wood like we had on all our other boats. The sea and the water would get into the penchant by the holes from the nails. It was during this discussion about the rudder which we certainly needed on the penchant to keep it from simply turning around and around in the sea. It was then that Mr. Patrick Brophy found himself coming to visit us. He heard our conversation and said that he had such a piece of iron, a five foot long piece of iron from the railway, and that he'd give it to us for free if we thought it could be useful. That thing, that big iron bar, was the thing that worked best. It worked as a rudder and a keel and a ballast all at the same time, that held the front of the penchant up out of the water just like a sailing ship. In large letters on the sheet mail sail were the words Winter, Magnum, Mail. We put it in English because if ever that penchant made land, it would certainly be land inhabited by the English. Inside the penchant would be a bunch of sealed tin cans. Inside the sealed tin cans would be a bunch of letters. And inside the letters would be pleas for help. One letter in the penchant, written by Georges Sauvage to his father on the mainland, began by saying, I am writing you this letter, but I can't tell you if you'll receive it because it is being sent in a penchant. The cable is broken and there is no way to send the news, so we thought of trying this. Eh bien, our winter is pretty mild, tout va bien. The main point of Georges' letter to his dad, though, was to send a shopping list for things that he would need by late spring, when the fishing began, specifically bait for his lobster traps, just in case the government had still not noticed or reconnected the telegraph line by then. In another letter that's enclosed in the penchant, written by Valjean Chevalier Pinchaud, she wrote, I entrust these lines to the randomness of the waves, although honestly the likelihood that they'll arrive at their destination is a slim reality. If necessity is the mother of joyful invention, then what audacious enterprises does it take to break the chains of a long winter captivity? After work building this deluxe penchant was completed, the letters were sealed up in tin cans as the penchant was finally readied to set sail. Virgin Chevalier Pinchaud noted this in her letter, writing, The contraption is ready. A barrel sailing equipped with an iron rudder, held with hope that it will hold its ship in position so that it reaches somewhere. Our letters are sealed and waterproof. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, the launch of this fantastic vessel will take place. The wind is favorable, and blessed be the one who will first come to the rescue of our frail vessel that will carry the sign Winter Magdalene Mail. February the 2nd was the holiday of Le Chandelier, which in English means Candlemas. Originally, it was a religious holiday celebrating the presentation of baby Jesus at the temple, but by the early 1900s, it had evolved into basically a big party that involved eating a lot of crepes. Their tradition back in the early 1900s was that while cooking the crepes, everyone would take a turn holding the pan with the crepe in it in your left hand while holding a coin in your right hand. If you are able to successfully flip the crepe and land it in the pan one-handed while holding onto the coin, it meant that you were going to have good luck in the coming year. So that's Candlemas slash Le Chandelier, which was February 2nd's significant day until a groundhog and its shadow overshadowed it. Should give it a try sometime. In the afternoon of February the 2nd, 1910, right before the Chandelier crepe flipping party, the Madelineaux gathered that day on the beach outside of the little fishing village of Havre Albert to watch the launching of the Penchon. Hundreds of people gathered to watch as the brave and cold men wandered out into the icy waters with the Penchon. 
and with great ceremony and high hopes that it would make it to the mainland, they released it. And it promptly flipped over, its metal sail flipping to the bottom, and it got stuck on the rocks. The weight on the top was unevenly distributed. So the Ponchon was dragged out of the water as the locals began arguing over how to best add weight to the bottom and rearrange the contents to make it stay upright in the water. For hours, the irate Madelinos tinkered with the Ponchon in the cold, wet, icy beach in the high winds and freezing February weather. Gradually, the crowds got hungry and wandered home to prepare the crepes for their feast of Le Chandelure. The beach was nearly empty and the sun was almost set and the crepes were getting cold back home by the time the frail little penchant finally launched into the sea. The wind caught its thin sail and it bobbed off into the dusk and disappeared from sight. The few remaining people on the beach returned to their homes for the candlemas crepes without a great deal of hope that their little penchant was going anywhere. Ten days later, a man was walking along a beach in Cape Breton when he spotted a barrel that had washed up. Now just imagine for a minute that you are this Cape Bretoner in 1910. You're walking along a beach in February in Cape Breton and suddenly you find this absolutely ridiculous looking giant molasses barrel welded into this massive weird metal sailing ship thing complete with a sheet metal sail complete with a five foot long iron rudder made from a railway tie washed up on the beach right in front of you and then you you open up this barrel and inside it it's filled with all of these sealed tin cans 125 different sealed tin cans are in this barrel so you open up one of the cans and inside you find a letter in a foreign language as a cape bretoner back then you're unlikely to speak French for sure, and you actually don't even speak English either. The most used language in Cape Breton back then was Gaelic. And in this barrel, suddenly in front of you, you have a grand total of 125 of these sealed cans containing 125 letters in strange foreign languages. So, what would you do? Would you maybe contact a reporter? Would you maybe give them to the police? Well, not this Cape Bretoner. He takes it upon himself to open up all those 125 sealed cans, take out those 125 individual letters and bring them to his local post office where he pays for 125 stamps for them. Also, postage rates had just gone up before this too, so now it cost him a full one penny per stamp, so a total of $1.25 stamps back in 1910, which is not an insignificant amount of money. We're talking like 150 or maybe even $200 in today's money this guy paid. He must have thought it was the worst message in a bottle ever. The poor guy probably saw the barrel and he thought he'd found an ancient pirate treasure or something cool like that, and instead it's assigning him a task, giving him a project to do, and it ends up costing him like 200 bucks out of his own pocket. So the mail goes on its way. The local post office official in Cape Breton actually didn't find anything unusual about any of this, by the way. And so the 125 letters went from one unusual mailing location, and it passes through the main Cape Breton post office in Port Hastings to be processed. It also doesn't raise any eyebrows there. It was only when all of these letters arrived at once in Halifax that finally a postal worker was like, okay, hold on, what is even going on here? The Halifax postal workers flagged up this unusual development with Nova Scotia's Postal Inspector General, who, on Valentine's Day in 1910, raised the alarm to the government and the press that nobody had heard from the Ile de la Madeleine, home to 6,000 Canadian citizens, for a month and a half. As for that Cape Bretoner, though, who found them on the beach and he paid out of his own pocket to mail them, he did actually get rewarded. He received $30 for what he did, which is a couple thousand dollars in today's money, so, you know, kindness does pay off. As for Rudolf Lemieux, the Postmaster General, who was also the Member of Parliament representing the Ile de la Madeleine, who'd failed to even notice 6,000 of his constituents disappearing, he, perhaps unsurprisingly, lost the next election. 
Rather unfazed, though, he simply ran in a different riding in the Gaspé Peninsula the next election, and he won. Once again, though, he was too busy climbing the ladder of Canadian politics to pay any attention to his constituents, and he lost again. Completely unfazed, he ran again, this time in urban Montreal, where maybe they didn't care as much about local representation as in the greater Atlantic Canadian region, and he won. This time, he won repeatedly, and he went on to become successfully the Speaker of the House of Commons for eight years, and he remains to this day Canada's second longest tenured parliamentary speaker in all of its history. I'm not sure what that lesson is, but perhaps if you don't pay enough attention to Atlantic Canadians, you won't get re-elected. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.